Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. I have a rather uh, involved question to start off with today. It says, uh, the party said, I recently read an article about children in therapy, and I got the impression that the therapists were part of the problem. What do you think? Well, it's a simple question, isn't it? But, uh, I'd like to answer it uh, with a long answer in a sense. The first answer is yes. I agree with the question, yes, I think so. But uh, I don't know what the uh, person read, uh, but I've had that impression for a long time that uh, therapists, counselors, psychologists, social workers, the training, the background they've had uh, sometimes uh, contributes to the problem. Now, I'm going to throw in educators as well, teachers. Uh, and here's why. You know, about, uh, oh, I don't know, a few years ago, 31 years ago, Lawrence Kohlberg published a thing about moral development. And uh, it was moral development in children. And basically, what he says is we can't indoctrinate children. He supposedly had done uh, a lot of research. He said, you can't indoctrinate children. And uh, most everybody at the time seemed to jump on the bandwagon with him. And unfortunately, uh, educators of all types, in private schools, parochial schools as well. It started sort of a movement, but that movement uh, was already underway, and so it, in a sense, gave credibility to something that was already going on. Um, in 1933, John Dewey, basically, uh, was the author of something called the Humanistic Manifesto. It became known as Humanistic Manifesto Number 1 because later uh, there was a uh, second one, Number 2. But uh, Kohlberg, saying he couldn't indoctrinate children, played right into the idea about the uh, thing called the, the Humanist Manifesto. Uh, Dewey was a professor of education at Columbia for years, most highly respected, world-renowned. And uh, what he says, basically, and what that whole group said, there were 33 of them who signed it, that uh, teachers have a special job to teach people to seek the good life. Uh, those words were not exactly that way. The humanists believe basically in three things. They believe in situational ethics. They believe there is no God. And they believe that people need to be atheistic. And I say need to be. Strange sort of thing to say that, isn't it? Because in the humanist outlook, it was the feeling and the conclusion of the people that when people, uh, ordinary people, seem to put their hands uh, in their lives in the hands of God or shifted the burden and looked at a creator or something that was controlling them and the universe that took away the power of the individual. So the humanist said the quicker people get rid of God and the quicker people get rid of religions that limit the person, the better off they will be. Well, that's uh, sort of a strange say in one way, but that was basically what Dewey was about. Put it all in the context. Here we are. We have well-meaning teachers, and certainly most teachers are very well-meaning. Uh, they are teaching, and they were learning from the world's foremost teachers, that this is what they were supposed to believe, what they were supposed to think, how they were supposed to feel, and to do a good service to others, teach others to be the same way. If you... Uh, Look at teachers, they developed the belief there was no room in the world for a God. This attitude would prevail in the classroom, of course. 
that God is redundant, <clears throat> that uh, people don't need God, or to quote uh, some other philosopher, uh, Nietzsche, well over a hundred years ago, that God is dead, um, you can see what impact that might have. Secondly, if there's no room for God, then we have to make decisions on our own. That gives a basis for situational ethics. In other words, we as a human being with our own brains have the ability to think what's right and wrong on our own. Of course we do. Uh, some of us believe that God gave us free choice. So we have the choice whether or not to accept or reject that. But the humanists believe that that is the only way. That's a mature way. If you're going to be mature, then you have to make the decisions on the basis of the situation, not carry on some religious tradition. And of course, since it is situational, then you have to keep trying new things uh, to find out what's the best way, the best way for the individual at the time. And so humanism becomes revolutionary. Now that sounds a little bit encumbered, doesn't it? Kind of bogs down in a lot of uh, philosophy, but <clears throat> that's really what our uh, school system has been about. Unfortunately, that's what our therapy atmosphere, the environment of most therapists, this is how they're also trained. They are not trained to include spiritual part of people's lives in their therapy. I say that uh, I know for certain about uh, a lot of the training. And uh, I know, for example, when I tried to start a course called Counseling and Spirituality at a um, state university. <clears throat> See, I thought and I believe that the spiritual dimension of a person's life person's personality is very important. And if we're going to be working with individuals, we're going to be working with families, then we need to know something about the spiritual dimension, spiritual side of people's lives. It seemed logical to me, but uh, it really got a lot of flack. Uh, my colleagues, uh, some of them were just... Uh, adamant, uh, no way, you're not going to have that sort of thing in a state university. Well, eventually uh, we won out and we established a course, simply like you would say, the study in the history of a Bible or something, you can study it from a secular perspective. We started a course in counseling and spirituality and uh, we were looking at ordinary people. Well, my understanding now is, of course, it's been all oh, changed from its original purpose. It's still going on. But it uses the, uh, uh, the course to uh, get into uh, study of certain kinds of religions, spirituality in uh, certain groups of people, which is all right. But it doesn't really teach uh, the counselors, the therapists, psychologists and others, how to deal with ordinary people's spiritual life. As far as I know, it doesn't. But that was my intention. If you take uh, teachers, uh, say in the middle of the 60s, <coughs> excuse me, and you have this great emphasis on uh, uh, crediting schools, then you took ordinary teachers who were basically not equipped with master's degrees in education and sent them off then to get these higher degrees, which became mandatory. And then you have them exposed to this new philosophy. Then it really caught on. Now most of the teachers, I saw certainly a lot of them, coming back to get their master's degree. For a while it was a master's degree in anything. It didn't matter. They just had to have a master's degree. Uh, to take people who were teachers, they didn't really get exposed to how to handle high school kids in a classroom or elementary kids who were discipline problems. What they uh, really studied and what uh, they still study, the most emphasis is on philosophy of education. 
And some schools, for example, Plattsburgh State, prides itself in teaching humanistic education, says so quite up front, quite openly. Uh, most of them are not really thinking of it the way I'm talking about it, but that's the basis of that. Uh, the uh, humanist, under John Dewey, he established all sorts of things. For example, uh, educational fraternities and sororities, which adopted the philosophy. He was really involved in uh, starting the National Education Association, which represents teachers. He was a very important influence. Yet, the National Education Association has been found not to represent the majority views of the teachers, who are the members and supporters, but that's not particularly different than other unions, is it? It really has, uh, humanism has 15 label beliefs, and, uh, and uh, the Humanistic Manifesto. And what it really comes down to is the three marks, as I mentioned before, it's atheistic, it's situational ethics, and it's revolutionary. But added to that, it says that mankind is a purely a product of culture. In other words, it doesn't have any tie-ins with anything else. It specifically denies supernatural values and the uh, elimination of all religions, anything that impedes or frustrates uh, the human being. It promotes the purpose of life being to seek a good life, whatever that may be, rather he uh, hedonistic, but it denies specifically any life after death. In other words, there is no such thing as salvation. And it um, puts down prayer life, denigrates it. It calls for a reorganization of all religious institutions to make them compatible and in agreement with uh, the humanistic view. Even calls for reordering society to do away with capitalism to do away with capitalism and change all governments which are non-communal to communal forms of government. <clears throat> so you put all these together, yes. We've had a very serious uh, impact in our education, in our counseling, in our therapy, uh, because of these views. And these views, basically, if you really study them, have become the informal philosophy of our government, the informal policies of our government. <clears throat> Take the non-certified teacher, send them off to school and teach them these new ideas and then put them back in the classroom to teach these philosophies. They thought they were doing the right thing. This more than anything else is, uh, I think, responsible for doing away with the religious emphasis, even in parochial schools, private schools, because they thought they were doing it, uh, doing a service. Even the private schools, that's sad, isn't it? Uh, across the border in Quebec, you see the same thing happening. This thing was going all over the world. Well, Colbert, uh, the man who first published some very well-documented studies on moral development, said you couldn't indoctrinate children, so people quit trying to teach anything that was called indoctrination, or doctrinaire views. And they started teaching this seek the good life and feel good about yourself regardless of subject matter. So in English classes, in social studies classes, in math classes, you had things that were being thrown in, tossed in, in the name of education, as if that was part of the subject people were supposed to be learning. Um, I'm reminded, for example, that uh, one of the philosophers over here at Plattsburgh State, now deceased, introduced in math classes all sorts of philosophies that had nothing to do with mathematics, as far as I could tell. The original question, are therapists part of the problem? Yes. Therapists, as a group, pride themselves in not taking the stand about religious views that people have. 
They basically like to take a stand that doesn't exist, just ignore it. We have parents today, well-meaning parents, but they were also, the parents today are, the young parents are products of this educational package that started basically as a formal movement in the 60s. And so most of them sense though that something is wrong. Sometimes the school's a problem. Sometimes the uh, counselors are the problem. The media, the governmental programs, all have jumped in. I don't point the finger at uh, any particular group because there's a, a whole movement that started here, a big social movement. And it's going and going as if there's no tomorrow. And everything is supposed to be the good life, the hedonistic philosophy. Big question. It takes somebody with a little courage uh, to really look to see what the source of the problem is. And most people don't want to exercise that kind of courage. Most people don't want to know that much about it. Uh, it's better to just let it roll off, to look at it. But when we become part of the problem, any problem we're trying to work with, is there's a term called iatrogenics. We become part of the problem. Until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good one. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. I have a question that says, how can men be meaningful today in family life? Interesting question, isn't it? Men be meaningful? This person said, I'm a 29-year-old college graduate with a good job. I have a wife who also has a good job. We want to have three children, two more than we have now. But he says, I'm puzzled about what's my role as a father? Well, <clears throat> I say good for you. Good for you to start questioning. If you weren't puzzled, really, if you're a deep thinker, then I'd say, well, you probably don't understand the situation. Remember you took a vow when you married, to love, to honor, to cherish. Most people take the same vows, basically. To forsake all others, <clears throat> sickness and in health and so on. Well, that's the first thing you can do to be a good father. <clears throat> Excuse me, to live up to your vows. Take pride in them. To set the example for your children on how to love their mother and what love is. Uh, it's natural for a real man to want to support the family. Well, you said you had a good job. And that's the support part. But you also said your wife had a good job. Now, if both of you have a good job, is the family being protected? Because I think the role of a father traditionally throughout the centuries of uh, humanity has been to provide and support the family, protect the family. Protect the family from what? Outside influences, intruders, marauders. Well, today, in protecting the family, it's very rarely something outside that comes in. It's not something physical that you can pick up a stick and hit. <coughs> Excuse me. It's unfortunately protecting the family today. It's protecting the family from negative influences. It's, uh, it's kind of sad. It's hard to recognize what these influences are. Now, in a previous program, I was just talking about uh, the humanistic element in society. That's one of the things to protect your family against. There are parts of it that are good, there are parts of it that are bad, and a good father is supposed to know the difference. What's a good influence on the family and what's a negative one? Well, today it takes a little time and effort to study these things. It's not as simple as here's a wolf, here's a bear, here's a something coming in, a robber, uh, to attack my family, that you could pick up a stick or sword or gun or something and to protect your family with. It's much more insidious. It comes in very quietly at times. It comes in most of the time well-intentioned, well-meaningful, but it's a sad kind of thing.
that these negative influences come into the family, sometimes in the name of education, but certainly in the media. You know, the media gets a bad rap most of the time. Some of the media is excellent, isn't it? But some of it is terrible. Terrible in terms of family values. Terrible in terms of what a person is supposed to be. The main thing, though, is we sort of paraphrase, we met the enemy and they are us. We look at it that way. What is it that we are doing that's a negative influence? I think if uh, a young father start looking at it that way, it'll be much better. <clears throat> Here's another one. <clears throat> Excuse me, it says, you often speak of weakness in the family. But what you recommend seems to be going against the tide. What difference could you make? Well, it reminds me of the story about the little boy who was throwing the starfish back in the ocean after the tide comes in. And uh, you probably remember the story when he was asked what difference could it make with the millions of starfish. And he said, it makes a lot of difference to the one I throw back. Well, <clears throat> thank you for the question. One family at a time, that's what difference you make. We start with our own family first, and we try to make it the best that we can. We start with ourselves and try to make ourselves <clears throat> the best person that we can. And yes, sometimes it seems to be going against the tide, but so what? What are you supposed to do? <clears throat> Just jump in, drown, go with the flow, get lost. Sometimes that seems like the easier way, but it depends on what you really believe in. I'm not reluctant to uh, recommend that people go against the tide if I really think that's what's good for the person and good for the family. Here's another one. I was asked if I thought children are as bad today as they seem to be portrayed on television. You know, I've wondered about that. I hope not. Because most of the kids I meet, and I, I see young people from time to time in groups and, and meet with them as individuals. As a group, I see basic attitude changes, but the individuals... I don't see a big difference. I think kids are kids. Most of them want to do the right thing. Most of them have the same needs. I haven't met anybody who has a different set of needs than the rest of us. We get these stereotypes. I remember thinking so very clearly. There used to be a television program called Welcome Back, Cotter. Uh, that was puzzling to me. I watched it a few times, and I was uh, teaching in religion at that time over at a rather large public school in the release time, and uh, it seemed to me that kids started copying the behavior of the ones being portrayed in that classroom. And it was certainly a different kind of classroom. And it was at the time when uh, yeah, there was a lot of uh, change going on in schools. I remember one school that took down classroom walls, and uh, they weren't classrooms without walls. It didn't work. It made everybody unhappy. But it contributed to how the uh, students behave. Contributed, I think, in a negative way. We see these stereotypes uh, in the media that Young people are egotistical, they're self-centered. They seem to just want themselves. On the other hand, you go look at a classroom or look at a hallway. Go stand in the hallway of a public school. You see the radical students who are making a very real effort to be different, and then you see most of the others. That's the way it is in any group, left, right, in the middle. There's a group that's striving very hard to change. There's a group striving hard to stay the same, and then there's a big group in the middle. 
Okay. No, I don't think kids are as bad as they are often portrayed. Here's another question. Is it possible for a child to learn from just one experience? One experience. And the answer, I think, is a uh, scientific answer would be yes. Certainly it's possible. Uh, it may take more than one experience to really change our behavior in some ways, but if we were to turn it around and say, whatever we experience becomes part of us. We don't have any wasted experiences, so to speak. Whatever we have becomes part of us. You think about uh, some of our basic instincts. We have instincts, though, as people. Uh, we're afraid of falling. Uh, we react to uh, sudden sounds. We have some basic instinctive behaviors, and we learn quickly from those behaviors. Think about it. How many times does a little bird have to try it after the mother bird pushes it out of the nest? How many chances does it get to go back to the nest and try it again? I don't think they go back to the nest. Has an instinct and spreads its wings and it uh, learns to fly and it's learning with one experience. Sure, right at first they're kind of clumsy. We've probably all witnessed that sort of thing. But I think the human being can do the same thing. We are pre-programmed to learn certain things and to learn them very rapidly. And uh, it's not a question, I think, of do we learn from one experience, but how much do we learn? And all of us as adults certainly know that we can learn from one experience. Well, if we as adults are willing to say that, then why not say children? Okay, here's another one. Comes along and says, what do I think of politically correct language? Uh, some of it's appropriate and some of it is, I think, downright foolish. Uh, I think it's ridiculous. I believe in the freedom of speech, so if somebody wants to speak a certain way and speak foolishly and whatever it may be, well, I'll defend the person's right to do that. But I also uh, will defend my right not to listen, which may mean I'll move away from that person I don't want to hear. I have the right not to listen. But when you really look to see what some of this political correctness is, uh, it borders on the absurdity at times. Uh, you can turn a channel if you don't like what you're hearing. You can move away from people. You can move out of the room or something else. But political correctness for its own sake, Uh, if it's to improve communication, any kind of uh, change is probably thought to be incorrect by some people, but what's the purpose of it? If it's to improve communication and one being relating better to another, okay. Uh, here's something else that came in, and, and obviously quite recent. A party asked me, and I was just listening to a conversation about changing rules on Miss America contest to include women who have been married. And the party says, what, what do you think? What's going on there? Well, I think that's puzzling. If you're gonna, going to call it Miss America, uh, well, by common language, we think a Miss is an unmarried person. There is a contest called Mrs. America. Uh, and one may be just as beautiful as the other. But uh, I listened also to some of the uh, conversation, read a little about it, this thing about wanting to change the rules about Miss America contest. And it seemed to have a political agenda. It didn't seem to have any rhyme or reason, as I understood it, about the purpose of the contest. Of course, Miss America was sort of the epitome of the debut, the debutante, a uh, person who was supposed to represent and does, they do represent, and I think remarkably well, some of the people they have selected in the past. 
really the best that we have in young women. Great. Somebody else wants to start a Mrs. America or some other kind of America? Have at it. Why need to mess it up and change it? Do away and destroy one thing in order to promote something else. Why can't they have both? Or several. Here's a question. At what age do I think girls should date, <clears throat> should be allowed to date? That is, to be alone with a boy. Well, <clears throat> I thought of this a long time. And 16's my answer. 16's been my answer, though, for a long time also. I had uh, four teenage girls at one time. And... Um, That's what they had. But it wasn't an accident that I arrived at that. <clears throat> See, dating is sort of an interesting pattern. Uh, supposedly the dating is when a couple can be alone without chaperones. And uh, at what age? I think 16 is a good age because at that age the uh, young person's mental abilities have matured so that the person can think of consequences, can think of patterns of behavior for oneself and for others without actually having to experience it. Uh, it's called abstract reasoning. Now, twelve-year-olds have a very hard time trying to reason abstractly. Some twelve-year-olds have a very hard time trying to reason whatever they may do. We've also seen a pattern and this has been going on now for about a hundred years, where girls are maturing much earlier than they used to, physically maturing. And a lot of people say, well, this child today is as physically mature as her grandmother was at an older age. That's true. But that's physical maturity and not mental maturity. We have no evidence that there is a simultaneous mental maturation going along with this physical maturity. It just doesn't seem to happen. And it's interesting because that earlier maturity seems to be girls and not boys. So, yes, some 12-year-olds look like they're 18 uh, in the sense of where they used to look, certainly 16. But uh, that doesn't mean there are any more reasonable in their judgment. So I think it's important. You know, dating started out in the 1920s. Before that, people didn't date as such. They courted. A young man, and I know I've talked about this before, but a young man went to the parents of the girl and said, I would like to call upon your daughter. And usually the old daddy said, what's your intention? And he had to say something that it was serious. And if people were allowed to uh, to be by themselves, it was usually within earshot. It was only a short distance away from an adult or somebody who was considered responsible. <clears throat> Some of you may remember the term spooning. Sometimes a young man would be calling on the girl, and the father of the girl would give the young man a stick of wood and say... Uh, make a spoon and so they'd go off and he'd have to be busy with his hands carving a wooden spoon uh, sharp kids of course just like any kids in any generation he'd already try to figure out what kind of wood old daddy was going to give him and have a spoon already made up but uh, it had to be the same kind of wood didn't it? it had to have the same markings so People have been doing this sort of thing for years. Before that, maybe some of you remember reading about bundling, where people came calling and there was no way of them being separated. If you were going to live in the North Country, you are going to go visit in the North Country, you had to stay pretty close to a fire. So, they let them lie in bed, but they put a big board between them, bundle up, and... Uh, Human nature being what it is. The dating pattern has four basic purposes. One is to learn to socialize. Came into being with the cars, automobiles. 
One was to find a mate, one was to raise one's social status, and one was just to have fun. The interesting thing about dating is the one who, for whom it's most serious, or more serious, talking about two, that's the one usually manipulated and controlled by the other one. Well, we have patterns of behavior there. And dating, yes. Unfortunately, today, too many people just jump in bed. There's been some good research showing that the longer people meet and are together, socializing before they have sex, the deeper the commitment to relationship, the quicker they jump in bed, the less commitment there is in a relationship. There's a whole lot of background to that. But for the now, this is Family Life in the North Country. I'm Dr. John Middleton. Have a good day. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Start with a serious question today. It says, how do you stop somebody who wants to commit suicide? Very serious question, very important one. And the answer in one word is try. Be willing to try. Ask questions. Ask what the message is. Ask the person what's intended. What's the intended result? I say that on the basis of lots of experiences. I'm happy to say, knock on wood, I haven't had a person commit suicide I've worked with since 1953. Now, that's a long time. Now, the next one may occur tomorrow. I've been very fortunate. But I've also taught a lot of people how to involve themselves, intercede in suicides, and I think successfully. You talk about what the person wants. Talk about the message the person wants to give. See, most of the time when people are thinking about suicide, they're thinking narrows, and they think they don't have any alternatives. There's only one way to go, and unfortunately what they're thinking is the way to go is to stop their own life. I've talked about this from time to time on this program, but I think it bears repeating because we have people who try, people who come along. And I'm well aware that if a person is bound and determined to commit suicide, uh, that person can usually find a way. However, usually the person really doesn't want to die. The person just wants to solve the problem. And uh, ask about it. Don't be bashful. There's no evidence that asking or getting a person to talk about suicide pushes them over the edge and causes them to go ahead with it. That's what most people are afraid of doing, but there's no evidence to support that view. Um, look for the signs. If you get the impression, you get the feeling that somebody uh, really wants to die, then just ask them about it. Ask them very openly. And a person isn't, what will a person say? No, nah, what are you doing? Are you foolish? How, what makes you think that? And, and if you get that question, answer it. What did make you think that? And that's usually helpful. That's a way to start. We have too many people who uh, are afraid, afraid to talk to somebody, afraid for themselves to ask somebody, are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about ending your life? Sure, there are a lot of signs about that. The person talks about not being around tomorrow, not having any need for certain things, gives away uh, favorite possessions, or starts structuring and organizing one's life so uh, there is no tomorrow, as if there isn't. We, uh, we know that uh, people who suicide are most often depressed, but not all depression leads to suicide by, by any means. Person is angry, person has a low opinion, a very low opinion of himself, uh, is upset, disturbed, has a plan. People who start talking about plans are usually very serious about it. Uh, here's another question. It says, I heard you say once at a banquet that we should have a family night. Uh, 
what is that? A family knife. Well, that's something that uh, I first heard about uh, through the Mormon Church years and years ago. But I think family night is really quite a good thing. Plan it. Uh, get the members of the family and tell them on a certain day at a certain time, a certain evening, we're going to have a family night. No phone calls, no visitors, nobody coming in. We're just going to be ourselves and be with ourselves. Now that by itself can be scary to some parents who may not have had a decent conversation with a youngster in a long time. It can also be scary to the youngsters who keep thinking, hey, what's going on? What's the purpose in all this? Purpose can be get acquainted with your family. Some of the best people you'll ever know are right there in your own household. Some of the most surprising people, the ones who care about you most, should be willing to spend some time with. You know, it's it's almost criminal how often I hear people say, I never had time to talk to my children. I hear this on the deathbed. I've heard it for years. That people seem to be afraid to talk to each other, to visit. A family night? What are you going to do? You're going to be with one another, each other. Sure, the first one or two, have a backup, some other plan if it gets too scary. Uh, don't have a good conversation. See, unfortunately, people usually know more about the characters in a movie, their background, their family, than they do their own family. So tell some stories about your family. Tell stories about yourself. What kind of person are you? Share that with the children. And listen to the children share their stories. They have interesting lives also. So family life, yes, I think it needs a night a week at least where nothing else is going on. Do it. <clears throat> it won't cost you anything. Probably cost less than doing something else. But uh, people I know who've done this, courageous enough to try it, hey, they seem to like it. <clears throat> well, when we get into these problems about who spends time with families, I, I've heard so many times people who say, I'm working to provide for my family. Two jobs, three jobs. It's kind of hard to provide for the family if you're not with the family. That's what the family needs most of the time more than anything else. It's time together. That's what family life is. It doesn't take a big house, doesn't take a castle, doesn't take a fleet of cars. What's most important, the relationships people have with one another. You hear people say that who have plenty of money. After they've acquired the money, after they get that out of their system, uh, they usually talk, start looking back and say, well, what's really important here? The idea of being able and willing to spend time with somebody you care about, that's a good lesson in itself. You know, we're finding, as we do research and reading in this field constantly, we find that some of the old-fashioned ideas seem to be the best ones. Old-fashioned in the sense that um, they really haven't gone out of style as far as the needs are there. They just seem to have gone out of vogue, uh, meaning they're not popular, so people don't think they're right. But some of the old sayings, some of the old traditions, seem to be a lot of fun. Why not try them? Go back to the family. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> here's another strange thing. <clears throat> Somebody said, is it true that people who practice religion live longer? Or does, does it just seem that way? Uh, yes, it's true. As far as the research evidence goes, <clears throat> the evidence seems to stack up this way. 
<clears throat> at least a recent study. You know, you can get all kinds of good studies, and you can research these things with a computer right from your own home. <clears throat> but people who go to religious services more than twice a week, or at least twice a week, live seven years longer than people who don't. Now, that's for the non-black. For black families, they live 14 years longer, twice as much. Now, what's related in that? Well, the people who attend religious services twice a week, now for a Protestant, that may be Sunday morning and Sunday evening, or it may be Sunday and Wednesday evening prayer meeting. For Catholics, it may mean going to Mass twice a week. But people who attend two religious services a week are probably of certain attitudes. They stay out of trouble. <clears throat> so life expectancy is a, is a product. But studies years ago, I remember studies uh, of people in religious life in convents and monasteries. They had a longer life expectancy and they had a better health factor. <clears throat> Here's another one. <clears throat> Comes in and says, do you ever see anything good about breaking up families? The idea of separation and divorce. The answer is only rarely. Uh, yes, <clears throat> I think there are times when families ought to split. <clears throat> but here's the only time that I really am serious about recommending it. Is if there's a serious threat to somebody's life. And uh, otherwise, I think the problems can be worked out. I don't think people should stay together where it's a real danger. <coughs> Excuse me, I don't believe that, I never have. But there are so many negatives that are associated with family breakups that in conscience I can't recommend family breakup. You know, we have <coughs> family breakups run in families. The children of divorce tend to be more likely to divorce themselves. We have suicide rates, we have academic failures, we have more incarcerations, <clears throat> we have problems, uh, delinquency of different kinds. So all of these come about uh, associated with breaking up the families. <coughs> Excuse me, I know that sometimes a family <coughs> breaks up because of these problems. But uh, we to put things in perspective. And so the answer to the question, yes, sometimes I'll recommend a family breakup. <coughs> but it isn't often, and it's for very specific purposes. <coughs> Here's what I see today with a lot of people. I see today people avoiding family breakup by not even getting married. I've heard people say, well, I'm not going to get divorced, but I'm not going to get married, so they start a family. What we see today is also something that I've, uh, I think, mentioned before. <clears throat> we see people having a honeymoon and then deciding whether or not they get married. All sorts of things like that seem to be going on. <clears throat> to avoid problems, they think, but they don't avoid the problems. That does not avoid the same problems. Here's another question. <clears throat> what are the signs of maturity for marriage? Should people have certain behaviors or certain attitudes before they get married? If they wish to make a success of the marriage? The answer, of course, is yes. Signs of maturity? You can take them off for yourself, couldn't you? And you think about it. Are you mature enough to marry? Were you mature enough to marry? First, did you have a good relationship with your parents? What in the world does that have with maturity? Well, mature people typically have good relationship with their parents. Sometimes young people today have the only thing they have in common is they don't get along with their parents. That's not a good basis for marrying. Because if they've had a good pattern of the marriage of their parents, this will likely make a good pattern in their own marriage. How about high frustration tolerance? 
In other words, he don't come unraveled at the first bump in the road. Able to accept partial solutions sometimes. You know, all of us like everything perfect for ourselves, but that's kind of rare that we find it that way in real life. So, we don't get upset easily. That's a sign of maturity. Another one is uh, <clears throat> feeling good about ourselves. High self-esteem. Sure, it's nice to feel good about yourself. <clears throat> See, if I love me, then I can love you. If I don't even like me, I can't like you. So maturity for marriage is, yes, to have confidence, to have a high regard for yourself. If I have a acceptance of myself, then I'm not going to be as easily frustrated. I'm not going to be as easily upset by some of the things that somebody else does. How about the ability to plan ahead? That's important. It reminds me of a couple one time who presented themselves, and uh, I was trying to find out the, some of these things from them, evaluating them for marriage, and they said, oh, yes. We planned ahead. We have the uh, paper plates and the napkins for the reception. And I'm serious. That was all the planning they had done about the marriage. And they were getting the paper plates from one of the paper companies. Somehow that was part of it. Another characteristic maturity for marriage is a willingness to be responsible, not just for yourself, but for somebody else. See, a lot of people today think they're only required to be 50-50. Now, that won't get it. 50-50 is not being responsible for somebody else. That's only saying, oh, you're going to go halfway, you'll meet somebody halfway. But to really be responsible, there are times when you have to be 100% responsible for somebody else in marriage. If you don't believe that, think of a newborn child. Child can't be an infant, that baby can't be responsible for itself. It has to have an, an adult who's willing to be 100% responsible. Well, we also have that in uh, our own uh, marriage relationships. Another characteristic is to be willing and able to invest emotionally in others. See, to give of ourselves, not to be so self-centered that we can't give to others. Another characteristic is to have a habit of happiness. Wouldn't it be miserable to be married to somebody who had the habit of unhappiness? Yet we have all seen that, haven't we? <clears throat> Here's another question that came along and says, is it possible for a mentally ill person to be a good parent? Yes. I've seen some mentally ill people. I used to live with them. Spent 17 years in mental hospitals. They finally gave me a key and I got out. But I've seen some mentally ill people who were excellent parents. You know, mental illness is sort of like a physical disability. It doesn't mean it can be totally incapacitating. It doesn't have to be. It can be defined and diagnosed without being a total problem. Uh, and we've all seen mentally healthy people who are terrible parents, haven't we? <clears throat> Unfortunately, it seems to come out that way at times. And what is mental health? I remember wrestling with that for many years, and so were a lot of other people, and it seemed to have attended a national conference one time. And they define mental health this way. It's the absence of mental illness. That was the only definition everybody at that conference seemed to be in agreement about. So, I wish you uh, good mental health. And that's the absence of mental illness. Until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good one. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton, and this is Family Life in the North Country. I'm going to start today with a question that sounds so simple. And interestingly enough, uh, the answer to this question is also simple, but it wasn't thought to be that way when it was first put together. American Psychiatric Association 
tried to find the definition of mental illness. The question is, somebody wrote, asked me, what is mental illness? And uh, I think it, we've all heard that word, the term rather. <clears throat> I remember so well when the answer was given, a commission was appointed uh, by the American Psychiatric Association and studied that question for five years. They came with this up, came to this conclusion. Mental illness is the absence of mental health. That was a full, complete statement. These people who came up on that answer <clears throat> weren't uh, beginners. They were very experienced, very highly educated uh, psychiatrists and social scientists. But that's really the best answer you can give, I think. And so when somebody asks me, well, when is a person mentally ill or what is mental illness, I always think of that, when the person no longer has mental health. And there are many kinds, many diagnoses, of course. Well, here's another question. The question was, someone asked me what I thought about adoptions. <clears throat> well, I'm all in favor. I've been around a lot of adoptions, and I'm all in favor of people being able to adopt babies and for babies to be adopted. Now, I prefer the adoption procedure when it goes from birth mother to the adoptive mother directly. I've seen that. I've seen the delivery room immediately deliver the baby to the adoptive mother. I don't like the procedure that so often takes place where a baby is put in foster care for six weeks or something, six months sometimes, to make sure that everything is perfect. Well, very few of us are perfect. I have met very many people that way. But, uh, so what I'm really saying is adoption through the gray market. It's legal. But that's really what I prefer than simply the uh, agency adoptions where they go through all that procedure. In other words, I've uh, worked with the uh, legal procedure where an attorney in a court formulates the adoption, adoption goes through immediately. I like that much better. I think it's better for the baby because it gives the baby a chance to bond with the parent immediately. And anybody who's been around dairy farming and knows what a problem it is uh, if that calf doesn't get to bond with its mother or if it does get to bond with the mother. See, it depends on what you're going to do with the calf. If it bonds, then you have a hard time separating. Both the cow and the calf are upset, okay? You take the human being, same thing. I, uh, I think the same thing applies. Well, here's another one. <clears throat> Unfortunately, sad situation, but the question was, my son is upset because his father is went to prison. And this mother says, how can I deal with that? I'm now a lost single mother. Well, a single mother has trouble with boys regardless, it seems. In spite of the best efforts, they have more trouble with in rearing boys. Doesn't mean they can't do a good job, but they have more difficulty than rearing girls. And there are several faces to that problem. How long is the husband, the father, going to be away? What was the nature of the offense? What is the child's age? If the son is embarrassed or uh, if he's fully aware of the circumstances of the father, and if he's old enough, able to read a newspaper, that's usually the case. Children find out about it, other children, other families find out about it, and so they tell the child. Uh, he may be being reacted to at school or some other place because of the circumstances of his father. It's not easy for the child. It's not easy for, the, of course, the mother and the wife. It depends on the child's age. The best uh, suggestion I can make is really to uh, put your shoulders back, chin up, chest out, and just go through it. Uh, act like 
you're going to get over it because you are. It is a problem. It's going to be a scar. But you have to make plans. And you have to make plans with a timetable of when you're going to do certain things. And you have to make a backup plan. You have to plan also when you're going to put your plan into effect. It's very important that way. You can't let one person's tragedy destroy the life of more than more people. The child, your own life. And what that means? It depends entirely on circumstances. Uh, they're never easy. I've dealt with a lot of people with that problem. And it's never easy. Keep talking it over. Act like the boy knows what he's going to do. Help him learn how to do it. And get on with it. Okay, here's another question. See this more and more. It says, I seem to be unable to get along with my partner. We plan to be married next year. What can we do? First answer is simple. Leave. Isn't that the reason you didn't get married, haven't been married? The second answer is find out what it is the problem. What is the problem? Um, and you still may be better off leave, uh, leaving because if you're half a year, six months ahead of uh, the time you plan to get married, uh, reevaluate circumstances. Not a thing wrong with saying, no, let's not get married. Not a thing wrong with saying, no, I don't believe that we would be happily married. Not a thing wrong with saying, oh, we have fun, but uh, you're not the kind of person I want as a spouse. And I say that both uh, male and female. Be fair. There's a pretty good test on this sort of thing. <clears throat> Even has been tested in laboratories. That is, putting people through certain kind of situations and seeing their reactions. Particularly good for men. If a man feels anxious, just like taking a polygraph, if his blood pressure goes up, and his heart rate increases, his breathing increases, if he's anxious and tense when he's in the presence of his fiance, the chances of that marriage lasting are pretty slim. Chances are it's going to be broken up before two years. So, I've wondered about people who have difficulty in these engagements. You know, it used to be strange. People nowadays say fiancé, and what does that mean? It means somebody they're living with so often. Um, I'm puzzled about them. The longer they go on, sometimes the more difficulties arise more problems arise and people just keep on and on trying to solve those problems and that ought to be the signal that maybe that relationship is not suitable. Well, <clears throat> next question is a little bit uh, related to the, the previous one. Here's a uh, sidelight here. It says, uh, when should a man ask a woman to move in with him? Well, if you're asking about a non-marital cohabitation, don't. That's my advice. Don't ask anybody to move in under those circumstances. If you're thinking about marriage and you're getting impatient, well, then cool it and arrange for the fiancé to move in shortly after the wedding. I think that's a simple answer. But... Uh, more and more kids uh, ask questions like that because that's what they see. Um, kind of remind me one time, maybe it's relevant, I don't know, but I was teaching one of my sons how to drive and we got through with a lesson and he said, Dad, well, you forgot to tell me, when do I start cutting corners like you do? Well, caught me up. I had to go back and say, well, I guess I better show you a different way. <clears throat> Here's another one. And this one pops up not commonly, because people usually won't ask questions about this, but 
I think it's uh, a more common concern. A person said, my brother is depressed and he's given up his Bible reading. Should I encourage him or insist on it, or what should I do? Well, <clears throat> first of all, most people who are depressed don't really do much reading. <clears throat> they tend not to want to. And uh, people who are depressed shouldn't be reading deep philosophical literature. Uh, it's surprising because I, I used to work in mental hospitals and so often people would bring Bibles and deep philosophical and theological literature for people to read and expecting them to get better. But we found uh, that uh, what depressed people need to read, if they're going to read, is something light, quick, simple, like shoot 'em ups and westerns. Uh, the good guys win. They're short, they're simple, they're direct. Uh, and try to avoid the deep philosophical reading, which may mean uh, hold back a little bit on the, trying to insist somebody uh, read the Bible or literature like that. And here's another one. It says, there's a man in my family who has spelled sleeping. Uh, is it dangerous? Well, spell sleeping. I have to inquire, well, what do you mean? How long? When did they start? When does it occur? <clears throat> if it's a medical diagnosis, uh, then follow the physician's advice. And if it isn't, you need to get a physician's advice. Because the, the cause of excessive sleeping can be a big variety of things. There's a condition called narcolepsy where people just fall asleep suddenly. <coughs> and sometimes that's dangerous because a person can just fall asleep while doing something, any, most anything. And uh, it needs to be evaluated what it is. Uh, most of the time when people say somebody uh, sleeps all the time, they're not, they're not accurate person typically doesn't sleep, it may be a depression, person may just stay in bed, worried, not wanting to get up, feels like there's nothing to do in the day, or nothing to do that's worthwhile. Sometimes though it can be a medication reaction, a excessive uh, sleeping can be a sensitivity to something, medication, it can be most well, there's such a wide variety of things that can cause that. Get good medical opinion. Here's another one. It says, my mother said she had a nervous breakdown when she was a child. She's dead now, but what does that mean? Is it hereditary? Well, a nervous breakdown is, is kind of like that question about mental illness. <laughs> I never know what people mean when they say nervous breakdown. So the answer to the question is, number one, I don't know. What is it? Number two, is hereditary? Very likely it is not. Because if she had it when young and got over it, maybe it never happened again. Maybe it had nothing to do with anything that's uh, inheritable. A nervous breakdown is a term that's uh, very commonly used, but... Nobody really knows what it means. Um, it can mean anything. It can mean anything from simply having some anxiety. It can mean having a period of depression. <clears throat> it can mean a full-blown uh, psychosis. We just don't know what the word means. It is not a uh, medical word. It is not a psychiatric word. And it's not a legal term. It's just a term that people use. Until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good day. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. I have a question to start with today, asking if I'm familiar with the juvenile jury. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, I am. 
And I'm very much in favor of juvenile juries. I've seen them work. I think they work very well when they have an adult backup. In other words, they have uh, someone who has actually veto power, um, or some board, it may be, or court having veto power. But most of the time, juvenile juries are very, what I've seen, very good in helping young people. The juvenile jury is for juveniles. I've never seen one a juvenile jury work uh, in the adult, where the adult was the uh, alleged perpetrator. Um, I like them, and uh, they really seem to benefit the, the youngsters who are tried before a juvenile jury. Okay, here's another one. It says, I think physical punishment is okay, but my wife calls it abuse and a crime. And she says, I'm an abuser. What do I do? Well, first of all, are you? Are you an abuser? What's your intention? Perhaps you and your wife should really get together on definitions. I don't know what you're doing by your question. There's no way for me to know. Physical punishment as such is not a crime unless it's done excessively. Uh, now, the physical punishment may be the uh, discipline of choice for some things. It depends on the age, ages of people. Uh, I heard one the other day that uh, really shocked me. I, I don't recall uh, the where's and the how's, but people being stripped and, and whipped. And this went on. Kids were in their teens. I didn't understand that. <clears throat> but why is the punishment? What do you expect to achieve? What kind of discipline? What alternatives are there? So starting with most people who use physical punishment do so because that's what they were reared in, the pattern, and uh, they think it worked well. And people who are against it typically were either extremely physically punished or they didn't grow up in it and they don't think it's necessary. Uh, what works is what's important. And sometimes uh, timeouts, things like that, work beautifully. Sometimes they don't. What's the backup plan? What happens if a child in timeout, for example, becomes um, more belligerent than it was before the timeout. How do you enforce timeout if a child doesn't want it? I've seen timeout work uh, beautifully. But then I've also seen when it uh, was didn't have any meaning at all to the child. So get it together. You and the, uh, the mother, get it together. Evaluate. Plan what you're going to do. If the child is old enough to reason with, let the child or children in on what you're planning to do and try it firm, consistent, and with kindness. Well, here's one that came along. It says, my cousin had been suicidal. Then he seemed to get better. Everybody was very happy. And then he killed himself. How do you explain that? Well, it may have been what we call a depressive reverie. Sometimes people who are suicidal, uh, they're caught up, somebody comes along and helps them save their life or interferes, involve themselves. And the person is typically depressed. Now, not all depressed people are suicidal, but most people who are suicidal are depressed. And what happens sometimes if a person is really profoundly depressed, they don't have energy enough to kill themselves. It may seem strange, but it takes a lot of energy to stop a life. And a lot of anguish. And so sometimes people get better, they become more suicidal than they were when they were profoundly depressed. And then sometimes a person who really has a head set on dying figures out how he's going to do it, and, and it solves his problem, and he, he seems to get happy for a time. That's what's called a depressive reverie. So that might have been what happened with your cousin. Uh, in 
in teaching about suicidology, I always caution the students, most of them are graduate students, agency people, professional people, to be alert to that. If you're working with a suicidal person and the person is depressed and they suddenly seem to, to get happy, um, take some extra precautions. Really look at it, what it is. <clears throat> Here's another one that uh, seemed to come along. And from time to time, I hear people quoting all the time about the peaceful countryside. The question was, how's the crime rate in the city compared to crime rate in the rural life? Surprisingly to most people, they're pretty much the same. You go on the basis of a population. And if you talk about, for example, the crime rate per 100,000 people, how many, how many counties up here does it take to get 100,000 people together? Well, like Franklin and uh, Clinton County together, about 100,000. Um, Essex and Franklin, I don't think, about 50,000, maybe uh, 60,000. So when you start looking at crime rates per 100,000, you may find that in a crowded city like Chicago, Los Angeles, New York City, uh, 100,000 people may live uh, in a half a mile square. And so a crime rate of what's happening within a half a mile of your home compared up here, crime rate may be 50, 60 miles away. And, I mean, the distance involved here. So it seems that the country is much quieter and safer. Uh, suicides and crimes and things like that, are based on a population base, and it's usually 100,000 people. And um, they're pretty close, surprisingly. <clears throat> Here's another one. It says, my husband of two years uh, I has a friend at work, and I found out that they uh, having extended lunch periods together at her home. And my husband denies that there's anything going on, that they're just friends. What should I do? Kind of sounds like a soap opera, doesn't it? Well, obviously the questioner wants to stay with the husband, keep the marriage going. What should I do? If there's nothing going on, then he won't mind stopping what's nothing going on. Um, it's a little bit of a problem. When people work together and they involve themselves in compromising situations, like by what rhyme or reason does he take a lunch break, ex break extending lunch breaks at her home, um, they may find it hard to work together after they break up, if they break up. So, it may require changing jobs for somebody. Um, we'll find out. If your husband's really innocent, <clears throat> or if he genuinely wants to work on the marriage and uh, make it better, great. Talk about it. And uh, you may need help. You need to focus on something else besides what you're thinking is an alleged uh, affair. Well, here's another one. So it's interestingly different. My wife of four years has a girlfriend who's been her lover for eight years. I can't take it, but how do I get an annulment? Uh, well, annulments are the specialty. I presume the person who thinks of an annulment is probably Catholic, so see the parish priest, if that's what you want. Now, some people who have these lovers, they're willing to uh, give up the uh, same-sex lover and make a good marriage. It depends on what's important. Because old friends may be more of a habit, a companionable relationship. Uh, you need some help chances are, and uh, regardless of the outcome, 
But the basic procedure for an annulment is to first uh, get involved with a separation, a divorce, and then an annulment. Most uh, parish priests uh, that I know of won't really talk to people about an annulment if they haven't gone through a divorce procedure. They may be willing to give the circumstances, but most of them say they don't want to get involved in breaking up families, breaking up marriages. Try to work out the problem first. It may be that uh, this can be worked out. Who knows? Here's an oddball kind of question. It seemed odd to me. It says, have I ever witnessed racial discrimination? I certainly have. A lot of it. I grew up, and I worked, uh, I grew up in West Texas mostly, and there's very little uh, racial mixing there. Uh, I grew up when I was a kid, I would see signs along the roadway, uh, some of them were dirt roads, but the main uh, roadways, uh, telling people of different color not to stop in the county. Don't let the sun set on you in this county. Uh, not just blacks. We didn't call them blacks in those days. We called them by the proper name, Negro. Uh, but there was also discrimination like that against uh, a word that was uh, for the Mexican uh, people who'd crossed the border, the greasers, they called them. There were signs like that. I've, I've seen a lot of it. Um, I've seen police officials ignore crimes in certain neighborhoods <clears throat> uh, almost any facet of it uh, I guess I, I'm familiar with I, uh, the book Black Like Me is the title of a book I believe by Griffin published oh 33, 4 years ago. I think that's about right when it publication date. Uh, describes, uh, I think in a, in a very realistic way, uh, some of the events, some of the uh, relationships that go on. I experienced uh, a lot of that. Almost the same trail one time that the author of that book took. Uh, and it was quite surprising. And this was as recent as, oh, about 65. Uh, I was transporting an escaped mental patient from Texas back to uh, Mississippi. And he was black. And because of the locations, there wasn't much point in I thought at the time of <clears throat> trying to fly because that, uh, you didn't have a uh, easy connecting airline. There were no direct train connections, so I decided to drive, just the two of us. And uh, it was very interesting to me because as long as I was with this man going through East Texas, East Texas is radically different from West Texas uh, in the racial situation. And going through Louisiana and in uh, Mississippi, I was discriminated against because I was with a black man. They wouldn't even feed us at a drive-in window in restaurants, drive-in fast food place. They wouldn't feed us because we were together. And uh, <clears throat> kind of strange. A few years before that, I broke some color barriers when uh, I had a, a voice like Santa Claus, the ho, ho, ho. I could do a pretty good ho, 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 Santa Claus. And as a president of a Rotary Club in a little East Texas town, they asked me to be the Santa Claus, and I found out to my surprise that they wanted me to be a Santa Claus over in the black community one time a day and over in the white community another time a day. That didn't make sense to me. There's only one Santa Claus, and as far as I know, Santa Claus is colorblind. If you want me to do it, I'll do it, but this is what I have to have. I have to have a one meeting. And uh, the city fathers had to get together. They decided they'd do it. 
And it was so different. First time it had ever been done. It made headlines in that little community. Small town paper, that sort of thing, but uh, it worked very well. I had a picture of a, uh, two different colored kids sitting in my lap being Santa Claus. I enjoyed it immensely. <clears throat> well, until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good day. Where it is. Hello. I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Start with, we have a question here. Well, it's not a question, it's a statement. It says, you frequently prescribe for mothers to stay at home with their children and rear their children at home. But how do you expect that to happen in today's society? You must be crazy. Uh, I must be. I think the implication is I must be nuts. <coughs> But I really do, and I think we take it one family at a time. I think if people are honest enough to know what's best for the children, being willing to do what's best for the children, now everybody will say so if you ask them, until it comes down to the, to the money. Uh, but I have to say it again. So often, the extra income from the two parents working is spent on toys, big toys, four-wheelers, three-wheelers, snowmobiles, big toys, fun things, boats, another new car. I had somebody yesterday who was having trouble with money and didn't have money to get a car repaired, so bought a new one. The payments are $450 a month. Somehow that didn't add up to me. My arithmetic wasn't learned that way. But if people are really uh, serious about it, they can do it. It's one family at a time. And when families go that way, yes, I think it's best if mothers rear their children. I'm not seeing good results out of child care centers. I just am not. And it's disturbing to me, and I've been watching these things for many years. <clears throat> well, here's a different kind of question. Let's go from children to the old folks. The question is, what do I think of the retirement system today? This has been in the news of late. I guess that's what prompts it. Well, I'm biased. That's nothing new, is it? For me to say I'm biased, I'm prejudiced. I'm involved in a retirement system, but I've also been... Uh, consulting gerontologist. And I've taught gerontology courses, both graduate and undergraduate. That is, the study of aging. That's what gerontology means. So let's look at the retirement. We have some very real problems. Now, first of all, I like it. I like retirement because it allows a person to do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, and not really be concerned about bread and butter most of the time. Because most retirees are going to eat. They have a place to stay, most of them. We hear a lot about people uh, being uh, on fixed income, yes. Uh, but fixed income means there is an income. See, I grew up at a time when a lot of people just didn't have income period. And to have had a fixed income would have been marvelous. So I'm in favor of retirement, but let's look at some of the built-in problems. When people retire today, their life expectancy is a great deal more than it was when the retirement systems were set up. Now that's reality. Put the arithmetic on it. Take my case. I've been paying into Social Security since the beginning. As a child, I started paying in Social Security whenever I'd make money, those quarters and things. And I always had the opportunity after I became a full-time employee of paying the maximum Social Security, uh, maximum deductions. Fussed about it at the time, but let's look at the realities. I've already outlived and received much more than I ever paid in. Now, oh, that's not fair. That's not reasonable. Uh, see, I'm glad to get it, but 
the uh, income from Social Security is not and was not based on the real expected life and what it would take to live on. So it needs to be reshuffled. Maybe people don't need to retire until they're 70 or 75. See, when Social Security was first set up in 1937, the, it was based on the life expectancy table to the 1920s, which meant people were expected to live almost a few days after getting 65. Well, now the life expectancy is almost 78. So who's going to pay for those extra years? How are these people going to be supported? See, that's one problem. Another problem is fewer children. What's called the dependency ratio. I've talked about this on previous programs. But the number of people working to support the number of people who can't work, either disabled, too young, or too old to work. That's the dependency ratio. The, our dependency ratio is constantly changing with fewer and fewer people working to support those who don't work. And that's a dangerous situation. So we have a life expectancy change. We have dependency ratio changing, that is, underpopulation. We also have inflation. A person who retired 40 years ago, the retirement income, what happened to it? Paid in a certain amount of money, and yet inflation for a while there was getting up to uh, almost 20%. Uh, they're puzzling, you know, how's that person going to, to really survive? So we have a different pattern, too, in terms of what old people expect and what young people expect. Most old people don't want to be dependent on their children. Now, in the last century, that's what most people expected to do when they got old. They expected one or more of their children to take care of them. Children grew up expecting that when they got to be middle-aged, they'd be taking care of the parent, one parent at least. Usually the men died a little earlier and women died earlier sometimes in childbirth. Well, those problems sort of went away with antibiotics. <clears throat> Pneumonia quit being the uh, killer of old people. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's still not a, a good condition to have, of course, any time, but before antibiotics came along, pneumonia was a frequent uh, exit for life. And so in the uh, mid-40s, antibiotics came into being. <clears throat> People had retirement system. They started changing attitudes. At the same time, the population growth was going down. Fewer and fewer babies were being born. And a different pattern. So it needs to be looked at and overhauled in a major way. All the politicians are politicking to get the old people support and vote because as a group, you see, they vote disproportionately. As a group, more of them vote than the other age groups. And so in places like Florida, you may have uh, 16 to 20 percent of the population over 65 years of age. So it's a block vote. Well, here's a, uh, another one that came in. said, in the supermarket the other day, I saw a boy kicking his mother. What can she do about that? Well, that seemed to be an increasing pattern, and I, I, I have a hard time with that. I have a hard time seeing children or witnessing children hitting parents. Uh, doesn't mean that the parents haven't done anything wrong and may deserve some punishment, but I think it's a breakdown in the system that when that's allowed. I think it should never happen. I don't ex don't accept it. I think the seriousness of it, if no excuses, no ifs, ands, or buts, it shouldn't happen. Because it can be dangerous when a parent trying to protect a child, and the child uh, starts fighting back and resisting. <clears throat> I saw a mother and a daughter one time pulling on each other crossing the street. 
and they were trying to pull each other in a different direction. At the time, I was driving, and, and it was not a, a 30 mile an hour zone. <clears throat> I was going whatever the speed limit was, but it was faster than 30. And uh, here these people were. Well, it wouldn't have mattered whichever way they went. It would have been better. I didn't hit them, but that was because I dodged them. They were out there arguing in the middle of the street and then pulling on each other. Dangerous situation. We see children kicking and fighting parents when parents are trying to discipline. Both parents need to get involved. They need to talk it over. What is expected? What is allowed? And to work it out. I don't think children should ever be allowed to kick and hit parents. Uh, for zero tolerance on that. Start a plan, say what it's going to be, bring the children in on it if the children are any age at all, uh, where they can uh, understand it. And from that point on, firm, consistent kindness. Don't forget the kindness part. Be consistent. You know, you can retrain an animal. We all know that. You can retrain dogs, cows, horses, pigs, chickens. Cats, cats are hard to train, they're too smart. But anyway, you can train animals, break habits with them, and get them to do things. Well, if you can do that with animals, you can certainly do it with children. Good luck to you. Here's another one. So my little girl's been caught exhibiting herself to boys. What can I do? Well, I don't know when it hasn't happened in society, but it depends a little bit on the age of the child. First, don't make a federal case out of it. I, I used to have parents be very concerned and ask me when I was more involved, with, uh, directly involved in families. If a child, say, is five or below, don't make a federal case out of it. Redirect the attention, change their focus, change their pattern, and go along with the day. If a child is older, six and so on, well, explain to them what it is and uh, practice a modesty. Perfectly normal for children and adults to uh, have different views on what's going on. But uh, don't make a federal case out of it. <clears throat> Here's another one. It says, my husband uses terrible language in our home in front of our children. What can we do about it? It's a serious question. What can you do about it? Uh, I would ask him questions. I would ask questions. What does he expect to do? How does he expect uh, his daughters to uh, to talk or to live? Ask him what's the purpose of it. Uh, don't reinforce it. Don't use the same language he does. It's a serious problem, but it's one that can be corrected, and I think uh, with good result. People usually clean up their language when they're talking to me. Why? Because I don't respond to the language. I ignore it most of the time. Rarely do I comment to people about it. And uh, we just go on from there. People start talking. Now, I used to be the worst in the bunch, I think. When I was in the Navy, I had language that was embarrassing to some sailors. I changed. If I can change, anybody else can. Until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good day.